English and later British monarchs have been using the title Defender of the Faith for half a millennium. It even appears on UK coinage in the abbreviation FD, short for the Latin phrase Fide Defensor. Where, when and why did this title come into being though, and why is its use in modern times controversial? The answers lie with Henry VIII, and so in today's video from History Calling, we're going back to Tudor England and to the middle of the Protestant Reformation to hear all about this title's origins, why it was granted to this king, how he managed to hold on to it despite splitting from the church in Rome, and how it has become a hereditary title, even though it was never meant to be. The year is 1521, and across Europe, the new and scandalous religious ideas of a German man and former Catholic priest named Martin Luther are spreading like wildfire, threatening the Catholic Church's monopoly on Christianity on the continent as Luther criticises its religious and financial practices. In particular, he has just written a book called On the Babylonian Captivity of the Church, which was published in the autumn of 1520 and which attacked the validity of most of the seven sacraments and called the Pope the Antichrist. This Pope, whose name is Leo X, doesn't need to worry about England succumbing to these radical ideas though, for its king, Henry VIII, is a devoted son of the Church, and he's so angry at what Luther is saying that he's also written a book entitled Assertio Septem Sacramentorum, meaning Defence of the Seven Sacraments, which is published in the summer of 1521, and which defends his religion and specifically calls out Luther's aforementioned book. There are disagreements within the historiography as to whether Henry actually authored this, or if he essentially used a ghostwriter, but on the whole it appears that he did compose it, though possibly with some help from the likes of his top minister, Cardinal Thomas Wolsey, or future top minister, Thomas Moore. He dedicates the book to the Pope, telling him in a virulently anti-Lutheran letter that Whereas we, and this is the royal we by the way, meaning that when Henry says we, he means I, believe that no duty is more incumbent on a Catholic sovereign than to preserve and increase the Christian faith and religion and the proofs thereof, and to transmit them preserved thus inviolate to posterity, by his example in preventing them from being destroyed by any assailant of the faith or in any ways impaired, so when we learned that the pest of Martin Luther's heresy had appeared in Germany and was raging everywhere, without let or hindrance, to such an extent that many, infected with its poison, were falling away, especially those whose furious hatred rather than their zeal for Christian truth had prepared them to believe all its subtleties and lies, we were so deeply grieved at this heinous crime of the German nation, for whom we have no light regard, and for the sake of the holy apostolic see, that we bent all our thoughts and energies on uprooting in every possible way this cockle, this heresy from the Lord's flock. When we perceived that this deadly venom had advanced so far and had seized upon the weak and ill-disposed minds of so many that it could not easily be overcome by a single effort, we deemed that nothing could be more efficient in destroying the contagion than to declare these errors worthy of condemnation, after they had been examined by a convocation of learned and scholarly men from all parts of our realm. This course of action we likewise recommended to a number of others. In the first place, we earnestly entreated His Imperial Majesty, which would be Charles V of Spain, Henry's nephew through marriage, through our fraternal love for him and all the electoral princes, to bethink them of their Christian duty and their lofty station and to destroy this pernicious man, together with his scandalous and heretical publications after his refusal to return to God. But convinced that, in our ardour for the welfare of Christendom, in our zeal for the Catholic faith and our devotion to the apostolic see, we had not yet done enough, we determined to show by our own writings our attitude towards Luther and our opinion of his vile books, to manifest more openly to all the world that we shall ever defend and uphold, not only by force of arms, but by the resources of our intelligence and our services as a Christian, the Holy Roman Church. For this reason, we have thought that this first attempt of our modest ability and learning could not be more worthily dedicated than to your holiness, both as a token of our filial reverence and an acknowledgement of your careful solicitude for the weal, which is an old word meaning well-being, of Christendom. 
We feel assured that our first fruits will be enhanced in value if it be approved by the wholesome judgment of your blessedness. May you live long and happily. From our royal palace at Greenwich, the 21st day of May, 1521. When Leo is presented with the book at the start of October, he very quickly issues a papal bull which is addressed to Henry, and which is equally effusive in his praise of the king as Henry's letter had been of him. This bull reads, in part, Considering that it is but just that those who undertake pious labours in defence of the faith of Christ should be extolled with all praise and honour, and being willing not only to magnify with deserved praise and to prove with our authority what your majesty has with learning and eloquence writ against Luther, but also to honour your majesty with such a title as shall give all Christians to understand, as well in our times as in succeeding ages, how acceptable and welcome your gift was to us, especially in this juncture of time, we, the true successor of St. Peter, whom Christ, before his ascension, left as his vicar upon earth, and to whom he committed the care of his flock, presiding in this holy see, from whence all dignity and titles have their source, having with our brethren maturely deliberated on these things, and with one consent unanimously decreed to bestow on your majesty this title, visa defender of the faith. And as we have by this title honoured you, we likewise command all Christians that they name your majesty by this title, and in their writings to your majesty, that immediately after the word king they add defender of the faith. Having thus weighed and diligently considered your singular merits, we could not have invented a more congruous name, nor more worthy of your majesty, than this worthy and most excellent title, which as often as you hear or read, you shall remember your own merits and virtues. Nor will you, by this title, exalt yourself or become proud, but according to your accustomed prudence, rather more humble to the faith of Christ, and more strong and constant in your devotion to this holy see, by which you were exalted. And you shall rejoice in our Lord, who is the giver of all good things, for leaving such a perpetual and everlasting monument of your glory to posterity, and showing the way to others, that if they also covet to be invested with such a title, they may study to do such actions, and to follow the steps of your most excellent majesty, whom, with your wife, children, and all who shall spring from you, we bless with a bountiful and liberal hand. In the name of him from whom the power of benediction is given to us, and by whom kings reign and princes govern, and in whose hands are the hearts of kings. This was all very flattering, but annoyingly for Henry, Leo died shortly afterwards, in December 1521, and before his bull even reached England. Fortunately for the king, the grant of the title was confirmed by the next pope, Clement VII, in 1523. This confirmation said that, We also, again this is the royal we, because popes were on the same level, if not higher actually than monarchs, so Clement is actually just referring to himself here, we also, the successors of St. Peter, in the plenitude of the apostolic power, of our own sure knowledge and free will, approve, confirm, and grant to you the title and name of Defender of the Faith, to be your own forever. So that would appear to be the story of how Henry VIII came to be known as the Defender of the Faith. He got annoyed at Martin Luther, wrote a book out of his love for the faith, and got a papal title as a reward. The story behind this title is just a little more complicated than either he or Popes Leo and Clement let on in their correspondence, however, and Henry wasn't motivated by religious zeal alone. Before we get to these ulterior motives, if you're enjoying this content and want more history delivered straight to you, remember to click the subscribe button beneath this video and tap the bell icon so that YouTube lets you know every time I upload. You can also find me on social media and Patreon, links are in the description box below, where I share additional content, including early access to ad-free versions of my videos. At this point in his life, it is true that Henry was a very public Catholic, though I think we can question the religious zeal of anyone who commits adultery and fathers an illegitimate child, both of which he'd already done by this point. He was also the king of only part of a relatively small island, however, and had a bit of an inferiority complex when it came to his much more powerful neighbours, the kings of France and Spain, the latter of whom was also, as I've mentioned, his nephew through Catherine of Aragon. 
Not only were these kings absolute monarchs of much larger countries, they also held hereditary titles granted by the papacy. The rulers of France were known as Most Christian, while the rulers of Spain were known as Most Catholic. Prior to 1521, Henry had no such title with which to rival them, and historian J. Mannering Brown, writing back in the late 19th century, suggested, and I think he was on to something, that Henry wanted a papal title to feel like one of the big boys at the royal table. The evidence he gave for this is a letter from Thomas Woolsey to the English ambassador in Rome, John Clerk, dated the 25th of August 1521, in which Woolsey told Clerk to present Henry's book to the Pope and in so doing tell His Holiness that the King has therein styled himself the very defender of the Catholic faith of Christ's Church, which he has truly deserved of the See Apostolic. Woolsey also included an annotated list of titles which the Pope could grant to Henry and which would be acceptable to the King. So you see, the decision to make Henry defender of the faith was no spur-of-the-moment choice taken by Pope Leo. Rather, it had been brewing in the background for some months, and this explains the great speed at which the papal bull granting the title was issued after the King's book had been formally presented to the Pope. The fact that Henry wanted a title to bring him into line with what other Catholic kings had is even alluded to in an earlier section of the bull, for Leo specifically said that previous popes had, quote, been accustomed to bestow some particular favours upon Catholic princes, who had defended the faith in the face of what they viewed as heresy. There is some other evidence too that Henry wanted this title very badly, but I'll explain what that is in a couple of minutes. It wasn't just as easy as Henry making a demand, presenting a book in order to create an excuse to fulfil said demand, and the Pope acceding to it though. In fact, Leo X faced certain challenges in making this happen, and those challenges helped to shape the title the English king was given. To quote a line from the movie The Incredibles, when everyone's super, no one will be. In other words, if you hand out special titles to everyone, then there's nothing special about them anymore. The system becomes so diluted that any awards it distributes are meaningless. Leo X and later Clement VII therefore didn't want to offend the very powerful kings of France and Spain by giving out hereditary papal titles here, there and everywhere, because then those who held them wouldn't feel as super anymore. As a result, the popes were very clever in the wording of the bull and confirmation of that bull, which made Henry defender of the faith, because they made no mention of the title being hereditary. In other words, it belonged to him personally, not to the crown of England, and his successors had no claim on it, giving it far less prestige than the French and Spanish titles. But hang on, didn't I show a modern UK coin at the start of this video and say that monarchs today still use the Fide Defensor title, though it's actually Fide Defensatrix if you're a woman? How did that happen? Well, my friends, it all comes down to the English Reformation and to Henry wanting to have his cake and eat it. Now, without rehashing in great detail the whole saga of how Henry ended up splitting from the church in Rome, which I've covered ad nauseum in other videos, in short, he fell in love with Anne Boleyn in the late 1520s, wanted a papal annulment to get him out of his first marriage to Catherine of Aragon so that he could marry Anne and hopefully have a son with her, and when he couldn't get this, he broke away from papal control and established the Church of England, of which he was the head. In 1533, he had his Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Cranmer, declare the Aragon marriage void and the Boleyn marriage valid. It was all super messy as he'd actually married Anne before the annulment was put through. And this was the start of the English Reformation, which ultimately led to the state religion in England being Anglicanism instead of Catholicism. It was all rather ironic, as Henry himself wasn't a Lutheran, as the assertio shows, and instead remained very much a Catholic in his religious outlook. He just didn't want to be told what to do by the Pope anymore, largely because he wanted to marry and dump his wives when he felt like it, and he quite liked being able to dissolve the English monasteries and get all their money. The papacy responded to these outrages by excommunicating Henry in 1538, and his title of Defender of the Faith, which was meant to relate to the Catholic faith, remember, a religion which he had just spat on from the Pope's point of view, was revoked. The king wasn't prepared to give up so easily, though. After all, if you're prepared to push through not just one, but several annulments that the Pope and Catholic Europe don't recognise, you're not going to get hung up on a title here and there. 
It should therefore come as little surprise that in 1543 Henry had the English Parliament reinstated via an act for the king's style. What's more, this time it was explicitly made hereditary, by adding in a clause which stated, The said style declared and set forth by this act, in manner and form as is above mentioned, shall be from henceforth by the authority aforesaid, united and annexed forever to the imperial crown of this His Highness's realm of England. By attaching the title to the crown rather than to a single person, Henry's successors could now use it too. Now, in the course of researching this video, I read some claims on the internet that current monarchs have no right to the title because it was revoked by Rome or was only ever meant to apply to Henry, but they don't appear to realise that it was issued twice, three times in fact if we count Leo and Clement separately, and by different authorities, and that the version granted by the English Parliament is the one which Henry has passed on, just as the act quoted a moment ago specifically allowed him to do. There is therefore no question that current British monarchs are just as entitled to call themselves Defender of the Faith as they are to be known as the King or Queen of the United Kingdom, and this is why FD still appears on UK coinage today. Of course, the faith they are supposedly defending now is no longer Catholicism, it's the Anglican Church of England, but that doesn't negate the title. It is the lengths which Henry went to to get this title back and to make it possible for him to pass it on to his children and other successors that further convinces me that J. Mannering Brown was correct in his supposition that the king's ego and desire to be on an equal footing with his fellow monarchs were powerful motivators in his quest to get this title and that he was not just driven by his indignation at Luther's works. The change from personal to hereditary title was a major step up from the papal version of the honour, but there were still limits on what Parliament could do. The new Defender of the Faith appellation applied only in England, Wales and Ireland, then later Britain and Ireland, then the United Kingdom and its territories, whereas the papal title had ordered all Christians to address Henry as such. Still, it was presumably a price worth paying to get to use the title once more without having to submit to Rome's authority. Henry died in 1547 and was succeeded by his son, Edward VI, who ruled until 1553. When he died, the crown went to his half-sister, Henry's elder daughter, Mary. Now, the defender of the faith title, which the steadfastly Catholic Mary I had inherited, left her in a sticky situation. She had no interest in defending the Church of England, as she was intent on returning her country to papal obedience, and she had the act of style which granted it, revoked by Parliament in 1554. Somewhat bizarrely, though, she continued to be called Defender of the Faith, even without papal or parliamentary authority. I can't tell you why she allowed this, except that the title was perhaps now so familiar to the English that it was done in order to preserve some sort of continuity with her father and brother's reigns during a period which was otherwise filled with considerable religious upheaval and change. This is just a guess, though. When her Protestant half-sister Elizabeth came to the throne in 1558, she soon had the Marian Act repealed, thus restoring her legal right to be known as Fide Defensatrix, and the title has been in use ever since, though it hasn't appeared on all coinage since the Tudor period, just in case you see a coin that doesn't have it and wonder what's going on. The only non-Anglican monarch after Mary to hold the title was the Catholic James II, who reigned from 1685 to 1688, before he was ousted in favour of his Protestant daughter and son-in-law. Unlike Mary I, however, I'm not aware of any move on his part to drop the title. The assignation has caused some additional controversy much more recently. In 1994, the then Prince of Wales caused a media storm when he said he would prefer to be known as the Defender of Faith rather than Defender of the Faith, in what was seen as a nod to the much more multicultural nature of British society by the late 20th century. He later walked these comments back, however, and the title was not altered when he became King Charles III. So as it stands, the British monarch is still called the Defender of the Faith, and it doesn't look as though that will change any time soon. Despite Rome's revocation of the title in the 1530s, and the belief of some that there is therefore no legal foundation for modern sovereigns to use this appellation, 
Henry VIII's use of the English Parliament to grant it to him and in a hereditary format has ensured that in fact it is valid under UK law. It is, of course, the height of irony that a man who wrote a book in support of Catholicism and was granted an honour announcing to the world that he was that religion's defender ended up initiating the Protestant Reformation in England. But that's Henry for you. I hope you've enjoyed this look at the history of the title. Before I go, thank you as always to those of you who support me on Patreon or by making one-off donations using the thanks button below videos. Let me know in the comments if you think the monarch should continue using this title, and for more on the history of English royalty, try one of these options next. Whatever you select, please enjoy, and until next time, keep learning.